I'm now going to present to you Liam Young. So Liam Young is a speculative architect interested in the intersections of design, fiction, and the future. A part of his work consists in identifying emergent technologies and from them, imagining possible future scenarios. He's situated within documentary and fictions. His projects aim to reveal invisible connections and the systems that drive the modern world. He's the co-founder of the think tank Tomorrow's Thoughts Today, a group whose work explores the possibilities of fantastic, speculative, and imaginary urbanisms. He currently runs an MA in fiction and entertainment at SciArc Los Angeles. Today, he's going to present us Hello City, where numeric technologies radically remodel our perception and occupation of cities. The presentation is an audiovisual journey through a city situated between present and future, assembled from real and fictional landscape. Okay, here we are. So, uh, what I'm going to try and do today is narrate for you a series of stories and myths of the post Anthropocene. It's going to be a, a rather eclectic morning, I think. Um, uh, we're going to go on a tour through a collection of sites, documented moments in vignettes of a new city, a city of the Prothanthropocene that t today we're going to call City Everywhere. So in the landscapes of City Everywhere, there is no city and country, no center and periphery, but just a continuous city of technology stretched across the planet. We're going to go through a selection of tales from the dark side of technology, an atlas of geographies and gadgets and objects that form a portrait of this emerging city. We're going to pick up from Mark Wigley's phone in the hands of that man. And today will be a city symphony stitched together from documentary footage of real sites that We've captured with the nomadic research studio Unknown Fields that I run from London with another architect called Kate Davies. The objects we create in order to understand and disseminate these conditions and short fragments of speculative film projects I develop out of these conditions with my own urban futures think tank. It'll be a collage of present and future and oscillations in between. And to see this city everywhere, we're going to jump in the back of this driverless taxi and head on safari. And the city operating system is going to ride shotgun with us and take us on this tour. And we're going to see the city through the eyes of the machines that have made it. This effervescent point cloud is how our driverless car sees the world through the lens of our own LiDAR scanners. And we're going to travel through an atlas of sights from the edges of the city and then all the way into the city center to see ourselves and the strange creatures that we've become. So here we are in our driverless taxi and the smart city is sitting beside us and it smells of hard drives and fiber optics and Red Bull soda. And the electric motor hums and we rumble on quietly. And the city has invited us on this road trip across its technological skin. It's looking forward to showing us around to visit the sites and structures made for and by its machines. Sites of this planetary city where nothing has escaped. And we'll trace their edges, glitches and anomalies and see where these invisible networks bubble to the surface.
And to begin, the city takes us back to the beginning, to the beginning of the beginning, to seconds from zero, 13.8 billion years ago when the creation story of lithium, a fundamental component in all, in all our technologies, begins its life. And we drive along the azure shores of the city's energy pools, through Chile and Bolivia, a land no longer of an indigenous population, but of evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape that lies behind the scenes of all the batteries that power our world. 70% of the world's lithium is here. And as we drive on a stage in California, Elon Musk, tech evangelist and entrepreneur, proclaims his vision for a green future, a world where everything will be solar in 20 years, but like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting a seductive future, but it's a decidedly uncomplicated one. Because in reality, he must literally buy Bolivia and evolve it as the new Dubai, because if the future is electric, if the future is Elon Musk and his Tesla fuel dreams, then the future is buried here beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. Can we turn the sound up a bit? Up a bit, not down a bit. That's up, thanks. And as we keep on driving, we see from a clearing in the point cloud mist the cavernous landscapes of our ephemeral technologies. It's in these massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our new technologies begin and end their life. And we each have a bit of the gold and aluminium from these sites and the smart technologies in our pocket, charged and quietly vibrating. And the digital models of these landscapes are now linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the stock market. And as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we're now escoring our economy into the archaeological record chronicle of the digital permutations that drive the modern world. And in this landscape, we see vehicles just like the one we're sitting in that are no longer have drivers, but are just systems. And these mining trucks rumble up mountains and tractors carve soil along GPS trails generated by these orbiting bodies of satellites drifting above. And as we keep on driving, we go deeper into the dust and we see the rhythms of the human conveyor belt in Madagascar. And these digging machines excavate the majority of the world's gemstones. In these illegal mines, it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. A hidden black market supply chain connects two choreographies, these lawnless mine sites and the jewelry stores, hip hop music videos, and celebrity red carpets across the ocean in the city center. So for the jewelry of the post Anthropocene, we've used the amount of rice the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a single synthetic gemstone. Where the rice is subjected to intense heat and pressure in a lab to produce a diamond for a gold hip hop tooth. It's an object that embodies the systems through which these worlds are intimately and profoundly connected. And in our taxi, we continue on and we roll up to the shores of the radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia that sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. And we take a selfie with our phones and we see our reflection in its mirrored screen because the material to polish its glass and run its software produces this very lake and collapse together in this single luminous surface, we see ourselves and this black, black earth. And from this black sludge, we've made a set of vases for the machines to thank them for showing us around. It's a set of vases made from the amount of waste created in the production of three objects, an iPhone, a MacBook, and a Tesla electric battery. It's a Ming vase for the city everywhere generation a new material aesthetic for technologies born of the earth. And in the same area of the city, we pick at a loose thread on the garment we're wearing and we unravel it across continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of the landscapes 
behind our runway dreams and street blue jeans. And before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of tens of thousands of miles across the planet in their production, making textiles the most globalized industry in human history. And here we meet the last generation of master weavers and real gold thread makers, a group whose skills will now die with them. As the apprentices that would once train with them now man the rumbling mechanized looms of global fast fashion, with raw cotton plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And spanning from fashion victims to victims of fashion for the cloth of city everywhere, we weave a collaborative textile with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in the silk fields of Varanasi. An audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftspeople and the sound of their looms is translated into a binary pattern and woven into the cloth itself. And the textile becomes an archive encoded with the skills and stories of a dying craft and woven with the same hands that it's trying to remember. And to make the thread for this textile, we follow the container ships that bring fast fashion to our shores all the way to their death. And we return to India and Bangladesh, where they're broken up and salvaged in the shipbreaking yards. And we collected fragments of this raw steel from the Bangladeshi shores cut from the rusting carcasses of the dead ships to form the core of the gold thread. It's a textile born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being. And this same cloth now covers a young Indian textile walker who's walking slowly beside our taxi on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields through the huge mills and factories of the vast textile supply chain where she works. And like the fashion catwalk, her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will soon export her and everything that we wear to the West. Because this city everywhere can no longer be described as a single point on a map anymore. Our technologies cast shadows that stretch across the earth. And we pack up all the objects and materials produced in these sites and landscapes, and then we send them off in these ships around the world. And this is the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry that now navigates autonomously based on GPS satellites and the ship captain and the portside crane operators have been made obsolete and their bodies have been repurposed as a component in the landscape scaled robot that stacks the containers ready for transport, bringing all these goods all the way home. And now our ship pulls up to the shores of the Amazon Fulfillment Center and dumps its produce out into the aisles and endless storage shelves and bins of the fulfillment center. This is where we keep, well, everything, says the city. So the Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on a complex sorting algorithm that's engineered around sales frequencies and buying patterns. And we watch as Amazon robots rush through the stacks, navigating from book to book, filling orders by following the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational programming. And this is the library of City Everywhere that's not organized around the Dewey Decimal System, but by aggregated data sets and algo logics and inhabited by bodies purposed as machines. And we follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about a brothers. It drops packages in an Amazon hailstorm across the city. And drifting above this sea, of neon haze, the drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. 
and we fly our customized drones like we once did our phones, and they follow us around, always with a smile, 16 meter meter propeller braids and floppy ears. And the air is filled with the digital confetti of our every desire and the skin of the city is warm, freckled with a thousand lights winking just for us. And the traffic lights flock at rush hour and the rumble of drone propellers becomes a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation. All the dogs in the city are walked by drones now, the city says. Think of the time saving. And they deliver our pizzas. Hot dog stuffed crusts is how we like them now. And a network of drones now monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone and uses it to pass notes to her boyfriend trapped in the tower opposite. And like kids passing notes in an old-fashioned classroom, they scribble messages to each other and they send the drone back and forth between the towers. And in this near future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but they also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teens might fall in love. And another drone armed with a dildo disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. armed with a different cylindrical device slips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. And another drone rolls across the floor and sucks up the hair of a sleeping owner's head. Throughout history, the city has always stood quiet. And now we're making a world of living objects that listen, that watch, and that talk back. And objects increasingly acquire lives of their own, and we become unwelcome visitors in the world we've created in our own mirror image. And Heinz was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. Someone scanned the label to read about the latest recipe promotion, but was instead directed to German porn site Fun Dorado. And now, as we head into the beating, purring, and whirring heart of the city, we drive along the aisles of Facebook machines, past all of our messages, photos, inane chatter, hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears. And the electric motor has given way to the whir of cooling fans. And it's not a grand cathedral, it's not a great library, but at a time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy. And we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles, like we once did for Rolling Hills and couples steam up the car windows parked in the artificial moonlight of vast data complexes, and power plant fog hangs heavy in the air. And hidden within the server stacks, the city wants to take us to visit the renderlands and the data farms, and we drive through the Indian quarter of the city. And here in the design studios, these people sketch out the designs that Western architects and directors have imagined. And across the other side of the planet, this anon massive anonymous workforce turn 
these wireframe worlds into the high fidelity digital architectures and developer renderings, video games and Hollywood blockbusters we all consume. And the city introduces us to Prakash, a render farm worker making and shaping the digital worlds we all inhabit. And Prakash has fallen in love with the digital model of a beautiful Hollywood actress after spending 14 hours a day endlessly rotoscoping, rendering, and compositing her into blockbuster films. He's lovingly airbrushed across every pore on her face, every strand on her hair, as he 3D models her superhero silhouette, scene by scene, frame by frame. And by night, when the fluorescents are switched off and everyone else has gone home, he straps on his VR goggles and they wander hand in hand through the streets of a city, his collage together for them from scavenged VFX movie models and leftover 3D game assets. The digital ephemera of popular culture fills our physical spaces. And with the taxi we and Prakash, we drive through a utopia that exists in the thickness of the screen a virtual city that stretched from Los Angeles to Bangalore, a world of demolished landmarks, drowned cityscapes, alien invasions, digital simulated avatars and actors, and our outsourced pixel projected dreams. And we keep on driving. We get back in our car and move on through the point clouds. And we see that this is the physical world left behind when everything disappears into the thickness of the screen or, or the lens of Google Glass or Oculus Rift. And perhaps these modern film studios are, are an analogy for a new kind of architecture, a new type of city, a new type of ornament based on calibration crosshairs and targets where architecture is stripped back to become the scaffolds and infrastructure for a digitally constructed world. An architecture that lies in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. A green screen studio world where everything has become a screen. And we get back in our taxi and we follow the photons, a trail of pixel breadcrumbs and keep on rolling as a dull roar fills the cabin of our taxi as we drive. I wind down a window and in the distance we hear the audience screaming and going crazy. Have you ever been to a Hatsune Miku concert, the city says. She's the pop star of our generation, a pop star for the machine world. Hatsune is a 3D projection with a larger fan base than most living musicians. And the crowd waves their glow sticks for a digital ghost of the city. Because Hatsune is the first animated pop star. And just like the Kardashians, the Hiltons, the bloggers and Instagram stars, she has no physical presence. Which is just a media construction and an agglomeration of pixels. And to the beat of Hatsune's hologram, the young ravers of City Everywhere dance with explosive contortions as they invent a new choreography that distorts the silhouette and disguises the proportions of the body so as to evade body detection algorithms used by the city surveillance camera systems. And they do their makeup to the gloss black mirrors of their dead screens. And they reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate of Moore's law, the latest phone model or software update rather than a change in season. And they adorn themselves in anti-facial recognition makeup. And they develop new camouflage textiles and a new hoodie that's designed to be invisible to the scanning technologies of the smart city. And their iridescent textiles reflect the light of CCTV laser scanners creating exuberant glitches, distortions, and disturbances in the data set. And they hack the city, searching for the wilds beyond the machine. And as we finish, we see flickering on the screen the words, Hello World, which is a computer program that outputs 
these words onto, onto a display system. It's a super simple program that's used to verify that a language or system is operating correctly. It's the first words spoken by this new system and Hello World burns onto the screen announcing itself, telling us that everything is going to be just fine. But in a way, this city everywhere never gave us this warning. We aren't sure how it got here, but we certainly aren't gonna let it leave. It's just too seductive, too shiny, and too easy. And we see that our technologies, our buildings, our spaces are formed from this planetary scaled machine, an infrastructure so large that it has become invisible, a machine so often disguised or ignored behind the gloss of the screen, the seamless aluminum edge or the glare of the pixel. But ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. So if we can understand and map these systems, then perhaps we can begin to reimagine them to conjure new stories and new mythologies for a new city. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met. And the city wraps us in a warm goodbye embrace and the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin and the streets are lined with sensors. The electromagnetics hum and it smells like it's gonna rain. And our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen aurora. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. Everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. And in the future, everything will be smart, smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In 